delivered, but like since two or three records, to me, you really, really found your own style and niche. Because like you know, like the first record, maybe the influences were more obvious at the time, and yeah. nowadays, like it just sounds like right sounds, you know. Yeah, I yeah. think it's like that with with anything, with any art or any music or any writing. It's, I think that's pretty par for the course, you know. I, and uh, we were we were not kids, but we were young enough. The band was young, and the energy was really hot. But um, like anything, you start honing in on uh, what is your sound. You can't really. Tell, it's hard to have your sound right out of the gate. Yeah. Even the most classic bands in yeah, history, sure. they, they just you know like early Pink Floyd records sound nothing yeah. like where they ended up or like uh, the first Zeppelin one is like Zeppelin. I mean, they had a, they did have a sound, yeah. but those guys, for for what it's worth, they actually had been uh, paid had been touring and kind of perfecting yeah, that idea. Stuff, yeah. But even they evolved. They evolved. You know, you hear from Zeppelin one to to presence or to yeah. you know to where they end up. It's uh, into the outdoor or something. It sounds it's evolved and it changes. You know. So I think for us, we we felt we had our own thing out of the gate, but it was we didn't know what that thing was going to be. It was a few different things that were our own for okay. us, and of course you reflect your influences. So I think by the time you get to um, head down was a big turning point for us, yeah. you know, because we really consciously, you know, I consciously really wanted to write a very big record. Like, you know, we made Pressure in Time, and it was this really concise album on purpose. Yeah. You know, I had made records before that with other bands that were really big and, like, deeper. And with this one, we wanted it to be not, I don't want to reduce it to a snack, but the idea of a snack, like, where you can take it. It's, a, it's an easy yeah, pill like to swallow. Vibe, yeah. You just hear it, and you're like, I like it. And they're three minute, three and a half minute songs that just bangs out, and they're like sugary, and there's hooks, and there's riffs, and that's what it is. Boom, 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 boom. So people go, yeah, I'm on board. This got me, you know? And then immediately after touring that for a while, I said, we need to show people what the band really is. We were already extending songs from Pressure and Time four, five, ten minutes, you know, and the EP as well. Yeah. These turned into like ten minute songs because we didn't have anything long. So we had to like kind of open up songs and, and jam and like freeform inside of them. When we did Head Down, I wanted to make sure we included songs that showed yeah. more of our yeah, potential. Song, like, yeah, so like, more of our potential. Yeah, yeah you yeah. get two part songs, you get instrumental yeah. guitar pieces, you're getting even more poppy stuff. It's more sugary and poppy and you're getting even more dark in like far out stuff and everything in between. So it's a broad record. So that might look schizophrenic or just like we're really searching, but that's what we were doing. We were showing our potential, not only uh, to the fans, but to each other. Like, what can we do? Let's try some things. And then when you get to uh, Great Western Valkyrie, I think we, we had our own thing really happening yeah. on that record. It felt, we felt like we had hit a stride. We got Dave Bessie in the group. It's, it's that record really, was to put together like we really we really felt yeah, like we had done something oh, yeah. right and um strangely enough as a band is just a living growing kind of organism when we get to uh hollow bones it was really what i would call it almost a transition record it's still a great record and but it goes somewhere we haven't gone yet out of all those records you get the hollow bones you're like this sounds like same band but different band kind of like really we were really pushing and searching for where we wanted to go and it's not that easy you have to go way over the line you can't just like you know go oh, let's just push right up to the line for us that was like going whoop let's have a different sound altogether. i brought in different guitars you know baritone guitar and just we went for a different kind of sonic soundscape on that one and some different writing too and uh that brings us to this one and this one teaming up with with atlantic and really really touring hard after all this time we really felt motivated and it was cool that atlantic kind of breathed the new life yeah. into us to almost like amazing. start another career it's interesting like that of course we're <laughs> continuing our career but it was almost like okay we're starting a, a relationship with atlantic so we um we really focused in on this one and we had time that's what we didn't have on any of the other ones. Yeah, because I remember like the 
the previous record, usually you, you work them like quickly, sometimes in the studio, for not much days, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. I guess this one, I that mean, like, more sort of that. Me and Jay had songs when we would go in. Yeah. The other guys didn't know. But I, you know, I wasn't just like coming up with stuff only off the floor. It was songs that I would bring in, songs Jay would bring in, but we would build them off the floor. So it's still writing off the floor, but these yeah. were like <laughs> ideas in my mind. Yeah, you, you got know, melodies already. Written. Riffs and yeah. melodies and songs, you know, they right. just needed to be worked out and, and, and we left them untouched purpose, purposely, you know what I mean? Like, let's not get too far down the road. Let's let them breathe and let's resurrect them or, or bring them to life. Yeah. Um, like, on the floor. So they have that energy. This one, we had a minute. We had some time because we were switching labels. We had switched our, some of our business people around. And we took a second to like, oh, let's... Let's uh, write together. Let's see what we really want to do. Let's really write some songs this yeah. time. You know? I guess when you sign with Atlantic, like you want to make a strong record. Like, Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. Like you want to be, make sure. Like you were doing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, and I think when we initially started to work and play stuff for the label, the first couple times, you know, we were, you know, I was, I was nervous. I imagine everybody was pretty nervous just to like a little bit, like, all right, let's see how this relationship's gonna go. Is this gonna be a nice relationship or is this gonna be a, a rocky relationship? This is gonna be the tell-all right now, how they react to this music because we wouldn't play anything that we didn't absolutely believe in and love. Yeah. So uh, the band and uh, the producer, Dave Cobb, we loved what we had done and we sat our guy down and uh, uh, Pete Gambar over at Atlantic, it's great. and. Right when he popped his head up, he just went, this is terrific. This is just amazing. This is great. He had nothing but great things to say. And everybody kind of went, Whew, okay. Yeah, that's really okay, so we can continue working and we're on the same page, you know? Mm. And from there, we kind of just had wind under our wings and we're able to really, really lift it up and, and make the record we wanted to. It's rare, you know, I think every time we've made a record, we've made a record we wanted to make. And this time was no different, it was even just a little bit better. We just felt like we finished and went, that's a good record. This is a good record. We, we made a statement here. Yeah, 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 definitely. And that's cool, like, the record is behind, because sometimes it's major. Like, I'm reading right now, like, the Steve Gorman books, like, called The Black Crows. Yeah. And when they were with Columbia, it was, like, the complete opposite. You guys were, like... We don't need any hits in this recon kind of stuff, like in the shit. Right. Kind of and, that's, <laughs> and that's typical. And God, they were turning in some of the greatest records yeah. ever. You know? mm. I don't know um, if you had, you had a story with Atlantic before, right? I read like in previous band, you had a deal with them, uh, with, uh, with some previous same band. Same president, yeah. same president with a different band. I had a, I had a deal over there. And, and the record never came out, something like that. That's right. The record never came out. It was. Uh, it was a good record, but it wasn't a band like this that was quite a season. But it was it was a good band, and we got much more money than this band got because of the time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you go back, it was the end of the giant deal. So we got this giant giant record deal and made a really cool record. It was really fun. <laughs> and, so, and so where are you like? This time around, like, cause I guess when you had the news to to join Atlantic, it was like, oh yeah, like you want to jump in and stuff. But since you had a story before, like, we are like, mm -hmm. yeah, I was apprehensive. Yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> this was also a joint yeah. venture. We're we're part of the low uh, low country sound mm -hmm. with with our producer. It's it's a joint venture. Oh yeah, it wasn't just pure Atlantic, but yeah, I was a little apprehensive, and I spoke about that to the label and to my A and R guy, and you know, it's different though. That was a different band. It's a different era, it's a different, different group of people. We're in a different trajectory in our career. We're not a baby band. No. Not, although we're not, uh, you know, for lack of a better example, the Black Crows in the States or whatever, we're not, we're not that massive. We're still, there's a name. We have a career. We've been doing it for, you know, seven records. We have a catalog that speaks for itself. Yeah, it's we all, foundation behind Yeah, it. so we, we sell records. We sell records, we, we put butts in seats, and, and we, we live on this, you know? So the label's not going like, oh, I hope this works. It works. And we kind of entered that relationship going, it works without you. Yeah. So you better take it from five to 10, because that's your job, because we already have it. We got the wheel at five. So if you can't push it up to 10, I mean, what are we doing? Why? <laughs> you know, we're not gonna stay with you. So they're pushing it up. We can feel them gradually moving it up. We're not at the end of this cycle yet. 
and um, I think they're doing they're doing a pretty good job. Yeah. Yeah. And I, saw, I also saw, like, seen, seen on the business side, like you, you are now with Rock Nation Management, I think, which is like the Jay Z thing, right? Yeah. So I guess yeah, they got very, very few rock and roll bands. I guess it's mostly like NBA players or like Rihanna, Shakira, Boxers, stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, stuff like that. So all the, do, yeah, do, are they, you like to be like the the old band, like you used to be with Eric. We always like better than Death right. or in Grindcore. Like labels. we're born to be the black sheep. Yeah. <laughs> So. We're born to be the black sheep and the underdog, and you know what? We like it. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you're not like definitely not drowned like in their roster. Like you definitely stand up like you're know, different, like yeah, from the rest. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, they've been they've been good. So yeah, you mentioned like Death Cub, like uh, is. Yeah, he's been producing your record since like forever now, and uh, every record. Yeah, so and he gets some writing too, I think, and stuff like that. So yeah. is he really like, like almost a member of the band, the studio at this point? Like, oh uh, yeah. Would you ever imagine like you know thinking like maybe we should change scenario and try somebody else, or are you too used to to have him and too comfortable with him? Like you don't. No, need I, I don't. I think we could go either. We could tr try somebody else, but we have a really strong relationship with him. Um, of course, I've worked with other people, and it's fun to learn other things from other people. But I, at the same time, still feel like I learn a lot from working with Dave. And you know, we'll, we'll slightly change the team every time. So we'll have different engineers, or we'll have different uh, mix engineers. Somebody else will mix the record. Um, The consistence are Pete Lyman always masters our records and Dave Cobb produces. I think we have a good thing and I think until we just don't feel like we're able to make what we want to make with him, I'm comfortable making records with him. You yeah, know, yeah. I think if our relationship creatively hits a hits a wall and we're not happy or he's not happy and we're not we're not getting what we want to get out of it, I think it's healthy to go, okay, well let's try something else. You okay, know? but yeah. Until then, I think you won't fix something that ain't broke. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think that's it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. And uh, and so yeah, on this new record, uh, you've been venturing with like 12 string strings next. Like uh, I saw you with like 12 strings acoustic guitar, and obviously you get like the double, like the old Gibson, like EDS, and I saw like Gower make yeah. one as well. So I guess it open up like a whole new thing creatively for you, yeah. The sure, I've had that double neck, the Gibson I've had since a, a long time. I've had that for 20, 20 years or something. Oh really? Yeah, the, the old one. I yeah, I've just I've used it. I used it with that other band that was on Atlantic. I used to play live with it with that with that band, and I put it away. We this band got a lot of um, brutal Zeppelin comparisons early on. And I just went. I can't break this guitar. Oh yeah, yeah. it's just yeah, too, yeah, much. too much. Yeah. But um, we've we've you know become so it's a real like vintage one, like yeah. Well, I mean it's a seventy five, seventy six. They're hard to date, but yeah, it's it's vintage. And then um, the other one is something I worked on with Doug because I I was using the the Gibson originally on its own, but I used two different tunings for the twelve string okay. on, on the Feral Roots. I used. Uh, And, and look away and um, all directions. There were two different guitars in Feral Fer Roots, all directions and look away. I use a 12 string, I was using the double neck and there's a couple different tunings there. So I was having my tech, Ben, have to tune them during the show and I was thinking, oh God, yeah. he's <laughs> tuning right next to me to the show and it's so loud and it's the 12 string, it's yeah. brutally hard to tune. And I'm capoing on one of them, and it's just, oh my god, I can't do this to him. So I decided I need just to leave this, one of them in one tuning, one of yeah. them in another. Yeah, yeah. I, I know it's excessive and crazy, but I think it's just the safest way to do oh, yeah, it. Sure. And who doesn't <laughs> want to get another guitar? <laughs> so Doug um, Doug and I worked on this this double neck. He came up with this for me. I, I had used the uh, Super Chief that he built me, the Red Super Chief that I named Donna. I used it all over the, the new record, and I just love the guitar. It's just a beautiful, great magic guitar, and said, you know what? If I had this guitar that I used to record this song, but double neck, and we did a 12, and he went, oh God. Kind of like rolled his eyes like, I haven't built, a, I haven't done a 12 string, and I haven't done a double neck. 
So I guess I'm gonna do this for you, but oh my <laughs> god, man, this is difficult. It's an endeavor, and he took it on. And Step up to the uh, I don't think he's gonna do it again. <laughs> he got, I got, I got, I got these uh, these late night angry texts from him <laughs> about building it. Uh, but 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 in all seriousness, it was a big endeavor. I couldn't be more happy with it. I think I cried a tear when it came out and I played it just because it's like when something, you need something and somebody makes it for you and it comes out perfect. Yeah. It, there's a feeling about it. Like if this isn't a, a car, this isn't like a home, I, I, it's, like a, yeah, it's, it's like I'm a carpenter and this is my hammer and it's the hammer that fits in my hand and it just hits, hits so right, it just weighted so perfect. It's that kind of a thing where I picked it up and it just sounded and looked and felt so right that I just thought, oh god, this is like, it's incredible, it's an incredible <laughs> feeling. Um, yeah, we call that guitar Serious Black. <laughs> yeah, super new, it's just, the, you know, the, it modeled after the six, the, the single neck, Super Chief. I call it the Super Duper Chief. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 makes so sense. Yeah, it opened it opened some stuff up. I'm, I'm, I it seems like the, you were in Power Tron, I think? Pick up like the last time? Not in that one. No, in this, in this, they, these are uh, Wolf Tone Cower Buckers. They're special, like PAF kind of vintage sounding PAF humbucker. You know, okay, okay. and that, and they're tricky. They're nice. There's, there's a Doug does this thing where we can split the coils. You know, make them single coil or do like a cocked wall, or do a, a, a out of phase. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's okay. really great. It's a they're really it's a Swiss Army guitar, and, and now I have this on a twelve string model. Which the top neck doesn't do all three of those options, but it does uh, split the coil, so I can do like a single coil twelve string thing. Sometimes it's fun to get that real shimmery twelve yeah. string sound in the studio. And so yeah, gear wise, uh, let's talk some gear more specifically. So yeah, guitar wise, like you said, like mainly like you added, like uh, I think you get like a crash, like you get like the. the I had that Gretsch custom made with yeah. Steven Stern in the custom shop. Yeah, it's a wonderful guitar. It's like a magic guitar. That's the other guitar I used on Feral Roots quite a bit. It was the new Super Chief that I got from yeah. Dub. It was the new Double. Gretsch yeah. uh, Penguin from, from with Steven Stern. So and uh, I used a little bit of the, uh, you saw this uh, French guitar that I used. Oh, Miro Duende. Yeah. yeah, so my, my kids called that, my daughter named that guitar Penny. Yeah. It's made with copper. <laughs> so um, I used that guitar on the record as well. Um, and then and then I used a lot of vintage stuff too of Dave's and popped a few of my things in here or there. But those were my predominant guitars that I used. Um, and the double necks as well. Just, the yeah, double necks yeah. I didn't use yeah. in the studio. Oh, yeah. I just had those. Yeah. Those were really a means to an end because I was playing. Yeah. I was playing uh, this this Guild twelve string acoustic that I got on the record, and I kind of went, "Well, I want to use a twelve string. I'm not going to use the acoustic though." So I have this double neck, and I kind of broke it out, you know, after we finished the record. <laughs> and then I used the Gibson, and then after that I went, oh, I think I need to get another one. Doug, help, you gotta make me one. <laughs> so then I had, I, these were like, you know, my whole rig isn't uh, uh, gluttony. My whole rig is basically to, to fill necessity. Yeah, yeah. You know? And, um, and uh, yeah, like, um, uh, and you added like some, yeah, before we were just like A being like a clean and dirty amp configuration with orange amp, so now you get Supros in the mix as well. I yeah, think. yeah, I, um, I was using two OR50 heads yeah. and then they turned into custom 50 heads um, just because they stopped making the OR50. And I used one that's a little cleaner and one that's a little dirtier, you know? So I, I, that's how I always did it. I still do that. I kept that same setup. All I did, because I used the, uh, uh, the Super O amp all over the place on the record, it was like one of my main amps throughout the whole recording. I think I wanna use this live now because it was a real prevalent sound for Feral Roots. And I run that as a much cleaner amp, much cleaner than the orange goes. Yeah. Cause I use those, like, if you think of it, I have basically four, tube natural nothing is touching it gain levels so i don't have to like hit it with a pedal or get any kind of sizzle it's all tube preamp tubes okay that's there's a supra amp clean channel yeah 
and I use that, and it has reverb built onto it. Then there's a dirtier channel on that Supro head that has no reverb. Then, so that's two. Okay. Then there's, you can hit both on the, the Supra model. And okay. it's, a, it's a Statesman, by the way. It's a really, really great amp. That the designer originally told me he built for me, so I said, oh, you know, I got one of the first ones, so I got to use it. I got to try it out. Um, and then there's a both channel where you stack the channels, and that gives you a little bit of like breakup yeah. in that amp. And it'll go full all out, but I'm using it a lot cleaner comparatively to the oranges. So there's three sounds in that thing. And I blend that those three sounds, or use it alone, and then I use that with my orange setup, which is a cl next from that that to both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you jump to the orange. Now my cleaner channel all the way, just regular clean channel on my orange is breaks up more than the oh, this yeah, both, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then that. I have my big sound. So that's how I'm doing it. It makes sense. <laughs> and they'll they'll combine. So sometimes I'll use the heaviest amp with the clean the heaviest so orange. Can, like, the with the time. cleanest. Yeah. So if you listen to a song like uh, Do Your Worst, there's a real prevalent clean guitar on the choruses. There's like a big guitar that's like holding it down, but then there's like a real shimmery acoustic on there too that makes yeah. it kind of lift up and percussive. So I wanted to accomplish that with this rig by running clean amp. And also this dirty amp. It sounds like two guitars. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, you get like a then big, I, big, big, big progression. Yeah, you get it. It's it's it's, <laughs> it's and I can do it all with one button because I'm doing. I built this rig with my uh, my good buddy Robert Bradshaw, Bob Bradshaw. So we can kind of turn anything on and off through presets. So I spent a good six months probably really wrapping my head around the build of this rig and programming. So you get to like, on this tour, we're digging into deep cuts and these songs I've programmed are, are basically our whole catalog into my rig. All the sounds, intros, verses, pre-choruses, okay. choruses, interludes. I used it for the Sabbath thing we did with the Grammys. I have like all, and it's programmed and numerically, alphanumerically named. It took forever. Yeah, it, it was even a, like balancing levels, I guess, like it should be like... Oh, it was a, yeah. it, it was a nightmare, dude. It, it's yeah. just a lot of work, just a yeah. lot of work. But when, when it's done, yeah. it allows me to oh, just yeah. go, I used to have to like really set tones yeah, up. Tap dancing. Yeah, you have to like hit three things in a certain order to get in and out of sounds. You know, you can't like turn a delay off and then hit a thing or turn a amp off and then a delay because it's still catching the loud sound or it gets tricky is what yeah, i'm trying yeah. to say so you, you know what i'm three big pedal ball and stuff like yeah like dancing around man it was difficult <laughs> and that's why i had to build this because it, it was too much now so i just said all right i'm going to do this so i hit one thing and the scene happens i hit this thing and a whole new scene happens this amp's off this amp's on these three pedals are working next button is no pedals just as a different amp you know, so it's it, and it's very easy now. It just took a lot of planning, oh, yeah. and <laughs> you'll see tonight it works really nicely, and it allows me to move around the stage more and uh, not have to overly think. Oh, yeah, all the pedals are on the back now, and you get yeah. like just like the controller like, right. on stage. And yeah. and yeah, I even I even stop stacking cabs. You know, because yeah. we have this beautiful backdrop. So for production, I just have one four twelve that both of the oranges switch into, and one two twelve that the Supro comes through. It's simple and it's it's massive and powerful and works wonderfully. Yeah. And you guys put some really efforts into it because you use your own mics, I'm sure. I saw the mics. Oh, so yeah. I'm like, oh, it's not like the random 57, like no, no, from no. the venue. It's like, cause most bands do that, you know. No, most my bands just like pick up like a uh, shirt. My good friend and longtime front of house, Neil McDonald, is uh, he's he's like the other band member. He's been with us since the beginning. He was the, the only guy we had. He'd be driving the van with us. It was oh, yeah. it was just the band and him. We had a we had a sound man from the beginning. We had a front <laughs> house from the beginning. Yeah, and cool. It's been him, and he was already a guy that did arenas and was a really big guy. He scaled back to do us. Like yeah, I wanted this is a band I want to do, and I'm going to go out on these guys. So we love him. He's he's family, and he is a fucking consummate professional, and has everything to do with how we sound out front. <laughs> the reason, like how that sounds big and a lot of these tricks and how, honestly, uh, I think just because I'm, I'm complimenting him and not talking about the band, we sound good every fucking time. 
we sound the best every time. Like, you know, we've done opening gigs where we've sounded better than headliners. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I've had, I've had band guys come up to me, famous people that I'm not going to name, huge, famous legends walk up and go, what are you doing? You sound better than us every night. <laughs> you got to talk to my guy. I'm not going to tell you what we're doing. You can talk to my front of house. And um, we hear that from audience members too. And that's because of my front of house. He, he really knows what he's doing. To me, you arrived at the point where like, there was like, it was really jam packed for like rock and roll or classic revival, classic rock revival type of band, stuff like that. And to me, you really like, it was hard to spend out from the mass at the time. Because uh, a decade ago, there were million bands like uh, doing rock and roll again, you know? Yeah. Uh, not like the Black Cross, for example, they were like the only one in the 90s. Like after Guns N' Roses, stuff like that, they were like. Lenny Kravitz yeah, and the Black Cross. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it, that was it. Like, yeah. and, uh, and Lenny went more popular afterwards, you know? And he wasn't like the same, you know? Like, but yeah, in your time, it was more difficult, I think, to shine, stands out. But uh, to me, like, you did it early on because. You know, you get great chemistry, great song and all that, but you also like stands out as a guitar player, obviously. And uh, and also Jay, like Jay to me is like one of the I mean I can dare to say he's one of the best rock and roll singer ever. Yeah. Not only in his time, like I can say that ever. easily. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I can say that no problem. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, what you find it, when you found him the first place? Were you like, "Wow, dude!" I yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was. Yeah, I was. I was. I was working with with another guy, and we're looking for people and auditioning people. And I had auditioned and looked, and I was. Um, I already found My Michael Miley, so we had already started, and um, I just I I had so many different auditions for bass players, and I had heard so many singers. It just it was really discouraging because um, I felt like with me and Miley we had something special and without sounding like a big egotistical asshole I felt like I had something to offer that was different I was coming off of a big deal I had songs I had people waiting and I felt like I was preparing to do something important that people were going to see and even before I even had my band I just knew for myself I'm about to do something. I can feel it in my heart. This isn't like me blowing smoke and pat myself on the back. I just knew that I was set up to make a statement, yeah. you know? You know, you can feel when you're about to come upon something for yourself like, I don't know how big it's gonna get, but I know I'm about to say something and I'm gonna make a big noise. It's gonna, some people are gonna hear this and I just wanted to make sure the quality stayed on that level, that kind of integrity of a person. And Michael Miley was like that when I got him. Yeah. I felt he was the same way. Like, he's ready to explode. <laughs> if I don't get him, someone's going to get him. And he's, he's a special he's player. He's the very beginning. He played like a big rock star. Remember, even in Tiny Room, like he was like, all showing off his stuff. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And at the time, we had uh, a bass player in Robin Everhart that was similar. Like, God, he was just a, like a fantastic bass player. Just an incredible player. And using him in a rock band, he was more of an R&B player. Using him in a rock band was just like, whoa, it really, it made something happen. Yeah. And when we were together, I felt like that's, I needed to find a guy like that. And we originally were working with a guy that I did not feel was that. I thought he was handsome and he had a great voice, but he wasn't on the same level. And, and if you have I, I love him, I, like it all falls down, like, and that's it. So I, I just immediately knew, okay, we have reached the spot with the band. This isn't right. This one thing isn't right. It's just not going to fly. Like so I, I, <laughs> I began to look, and quickly came upon his his thing. And when I heard him, I, I it was really powerful. Like it was not like you know I only heard one, like like 15 seconds of a song. And I stopped what I was listening to, and I was married at the time. I called my my wife at the time up, and I said, "You have to hear this." I didn't have even listened to more of it, but in this 15 seconds, I kind of like almost had tears in my eye. I said, "I've been looking for something like hard, like hard. I've been trying to dig it out like every day of my life. Every day I'm looking in every corner for it." And I said, "I." I think I just found it. I think this is the voice I've been looking for. And I played it for her and she just started crying. I said, this is heavy. This is like something happened. Like there's something like worked out and like aligned it for us. You know what I mean? And then 
it ended up being a friend. So it was powerful for me in seconds. Right when I heard it, I went, this is it, dude. This, is, this, this was the missing link. And then when we got together, it was just that. It just unrolled, just like how I thought yeah. it would. Like, that's it. <laughs> so it's, to, to, to what he's become to this point now, yeah, I mean, he's easily stands in, in, a, in, a, in a very, uh, there's just not too many people that can stand to him. Oh, no, no, no. And yeah, in this like era, it's... none. In, yeah. in, in, the, in the whole epoch, the whole big era, I think very few, if any, I think he stands shoulder to shoulder with the, the greatest ah. ever. And it's a blessing because you could, you couldn't be like the best band ever if you have a crap singer, like it's like, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, you gotta have a great, you have to have great it's singer. Great. But it's more than that. It's more than the comparisons people make, and it's what's really great about him. I think most people don't even. And he's as great live as he's in the studio. Also, like he's really consistent, like live. You know. I think what's really yeah. great for for me in, in our relationship, most people don't even really quite understand the depth of it, and that's fine. But they, you can just take my word for it that it's there. It's it's enough what you see. It's enough what you All see right. and what you hear, and, you know. But there's there's another layer to it that makes it it's real. It's real, and it'll it'll never be. It's un. It's it's irreducible.